This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. My guest today is Jeff Speck. Jeff is the author of Walkable City and Walkable City Rules. As an urban planner and city designer, he specializes in and advocates for human modes of transportation. First and foremost, walking, but also biking. Using years of research and action, Jeff shows how cities become better places when we move away from an automobile-focused life. As I spend a lot of my time walking through cities whenever I get a chance, preferring to travel on foot when possible, I knew there were some places that felt safer as a pedestrian and were generally more enjoyable to walk through. Jeff lays out exactly why that is and what each of us can do to advocate for these changes in our local towns and cities. In the process, we can limit gentrification, which Jeff expands on during the interview, making cities even friendlier to people and more sustainable for generations to come. Enjoy this conversation with Jeff, and I'll join you again after. Then Jeff, can you give us a bit of your biography and background, how you came to planning and why walkable cities and pedestrian-friendly spaces are so important? Sure. So uh, I I am a city planner. I'm a registered city, certified city. I'm certifiable and certified as a city planner. But my training was all in architecture. And I I knew from a very young age, or I suspected that I wanted to be an architect. And I followed the path that you might follow to do that. But when I was an undergraduate still in school, I I started, actually, I I wrote a thesis called The Architectural Gap. It was an undergraduate thesis on the the distinction between professional interest, or I should say professional taste and public taste in architecture and how what the public seems to like isn't always what architects seem to like, or more importantly, vice versa. (laughs) And and that got me thinking in a very liberal arts way about the the relationship between design and society and that, that focus on the impacts of design on the culture led me to stop looking at individual buildings and caring more about how they settle into the landscape and actually whether the landscape, the the built environment is worthy of of individual buildings. And in that huge context then, and having studied both architecture as an art and as a potential profession, in the mid 80s, I started hearing about the work of this husband and wife team, Andres Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, they were architects, but they had ended up kind of, I wouldn't say accidentally, because there was a ton of intention involved, but they had ended up in 1970, 1980, designing what in retrospect turned out to be the first real new village in America in 60, 70 years. And it was a, something that we had forgotten to do and that we had eventually made illegal. And then the whole, the whole industry of building places in America had taken this other track, starting really, you know, well, there, there was a big, of course, gap during the, the wars and the depression. But then when building kicked in again, there was an entirely new model, which was rather than building villages, rather than building neighborhoods, rather than building mixed use walkable places to live, work, play, recreate, you know, worship and do everything else that we do, we were only designing pods. Developers were only developing and designers were only designing housing subdivisions, shopping malls, office parks, et cetera, large areas of single use separated in the landscape and connected usually only with with highways and and other roads. And with the design of this little vacation resort called Seaside, Andres and Liz reintroduced to America and to me the idea of designing mixed-use walkable places again, you know, a, a technique that had just been utterly forgotten. And that just blew my mind. That I, you know, I knew I loved certain places, and I knew I hated other places. I knew that I was happy in some places and sad in others. And and Andres and Liz made it clear to me that that was a function of design. And so I, uh, when I got out of architecture school, or actually <clears throat> even before I started architecture school, I reached out to them, hunted them down. Uh, but when I graduated architecture school at age thirty, after having done a number of things, including being an investment banker briefly. I made a pilgrimage to their firm in Miami, and I spent the next 10 years with them uh, learning to do what they do. And that, be- that became the, the foundation of all my practice uh, since then, which is essentially to do two things, to make new places that are modeled on older places that we love, and to go to older places that we love that have been undermined by the last 60, 70 years of suburban growth, 
and make them more urban and make them more livable, make them more walkable. And walkability became, I, I guess, my real contribution, having learned all this from other people, my real contribution has been to communicate this through the language of walkability because we called it lots of different things. At first it was called neo-traditional town planning. Then it was called the new urbanism and eventually it just became best practices in, in, in urban design. But when you discuss it in terms of walkability, suddenly you can communicate it so much better. You can sell it so much better. People embrace it. And it also allows you to make a lot of better decisions as you're designing places. If you make walkability, the ultimate objective. And my first introduction to the role of architecture in creating something that is human scaled was a combination of Christopher Alexander's pattern language and all of these different things that go into making something feel very personable, very human. And then it was the work of Johann von Langen in The Barefoot Architect. You know, I was reading this book thinking it was going to be all of these designs that we could use for homes, but then you get to the later chapters and it's about, okay, here's the importance of a city square. Here's why it's important to have markets in places. Here's how we can use street alignment in order to create shaded areas that are open places for people to congregate and to spend time together, depending on the time of day. And then it was reading your book, Walkable City, that really tied all that together for me. And as you say, you know, these places that you like and don't like, I think about the different cities that I grew up in when I was a child in Western Maryland, that Frederick, Maryland had a lot of walkability. Once you made it to downtown, there were restaurants and stores and housing and all of these different pieces blended together in a way that you could just walk down a couple of blocks and meet most of your needs within this town. And that really got me thinking about why this matters. And then your work tying in green space and why even something as simple as the timing of crosswalks to make something more pedestrian friendly. How did you, as you explored these different ideas come to this sense of what makes a city truly livable for people and what the characteristics are of walkability? That's a very large question. I'll try not to give it too large an answer. First, let me say, I didn't realize you were a Frednick. Uh, <laughs> Frederick is a uh, super lovely place. And coincidentally, my wife and I almost moved there. We were looking at kind of the whole DC area. And we totally fell in love with Frederick. We fell in love with one particular house. Unfortunately, there was a pond on site, but the pond was in the basement. So we didn't buy the house. <laughs> but for those people who don't know Frederick, it is your classic American small town with an incredible main street, some wonderful public works that were done around a canal to make it a real attraction in the downtown, a smart decision to create a municipal parking garage hidden in the middle of a block that you hardly even see, but that handles the parking so that the streets aren't overwhelmed with surface parking lots. A lot of good decisions and just a lot of great character in that town that does all the things that you ask about. I think that I've been making a, great, a greater effort in my work, particularly these days with the current conversation around equity in the city, to not view what makes cities great through the lens of elite projection. And elite projection is a term that the, the transit expert, Jarrett Walker, and his, his moniker in his books and online is human transit. If you look up human transit, you will learn a lot. But he, he coined this phrase, elite projection, which is essentially that it points out the fact that in our cities and communities, the, the people who tend to make the decisions about the shape of those cities tend to be the people with power. People with power tend to have wealth. They tend to see things through their wealthy eyes. And that includes decisions that are made about transportation modes. So, you know, I was lecturing in Mexico City and I was watching as I was told that they were increasing the price of the buses because, the, you know, they were losing money on the buses. Meanwhile, they were building wider roads for the cars. And I asked them, what percentage of your workers get to the city, get downtown by car, and what percentage get downtown by transit, biking or walking? It turns out only 20% of the people that got downtown were driving. And yet they were reshaping the city and spending their money around making that easier and making the buses more expensive to help pay for it. That's a classic example of elite projection about making decisions that make sense through the eyes of the decision makers, but don't serve the whole community. And so I think it's important to, when you ask what makes a walkable place, to think very practically and to say, our goal is to free our citizens from the tremendous burden of, of automobile ownership. Those people who can afford it, like you and me, you know, we can have cars, ideally as a luxury, 
you know, a way to get to the summer house <laughs> and maybe a way to drive downtown if we're in a hurry and we want to pay for the parking and all those other things. But what about all the folks who shouldn't be burdened with that cost? And if you're a poor American, according to the federal government, you're spending 40% of your income on transportation. And if you're a quote unquote working class American, according to the, you know, the way the federal government coins that, uh, you know, uh, attributes that, that phrase, working class, you're actually spending as much on transportation as you are on housing. So it's a tremendous burden. We used to spend 10% of our income back in the 1970s on transportation, and we now spend 20% of our income on transportation. And that's because we have, you know, from the 70s to 2010, or even to today, the trend has been to make it more and more required that we have automobiles, not as, not as an instrument of freedom, but as a prosthetic device. You can't live your life effectively without one. And that's doubled the transportation costs then that we have to, to, to shoulder. So the first step to making a walkable city is simply to make one in which the non-driving lifestyle is a viable lifestyle. And that then leads to a whole bunch of choices that you would make around making walking useful, but ultimately also making it safe, making it comfortable and making it interesting. And that, that's the structure that I use to, to give the advice that I give on, on doing that. So then what are some of the characteristics then for design and planning that makes walking viable, safe, and interesting? So my list is useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. And that's how I organize my books, as well as my lectures and the advice that I give to folks. For example, I do, I do walkability studies for cities. I've done about 14 of them. And the advice is organized in those categories. It expands the conversation a bit beyond what I just said about the simple ability to get around, because you have to acknowledge that, that particularly in America, and my focus has always been America, most people have a choice. Most people already own cars, and that car is sitting there in the driveway between them and everything, and there's all these incentives to use it. You don't pay the full cost of driving by a long shot. It's tremendously subsidized by general taxation and, and other things that, that you don't pay when you're driving. We all pay for other people to drive. And, you know, urban areas, subsidized suburban areas in so many ways as well. But the, the circumstance then is that if you're going to get people to walk, because most people do have a choice, then the walk has to be as good as the drive. And to do so, it can't just be possible. It also has to be safe, comfortable, and interesting. Now, the, the possibility is about mixed use. And that means, as, as I've already suggested, that when we make new places, they need to be finely grained mixes of, of uses that are balanced so that you have access to most of your daily needs within walking distance. That's how we used to do it, and that's how our best new places currently do it. When you're looking at an existing place, like a downtown or a main street, you ask the question, you know, what is our balance of uses, and is it a good balance? In most American downtowns, housing is extremely underrepresented. And that's due to uh, many functions, many, many histories, particularly surrounding white flight and other things. But the way to make a downtown more useful is to put a ton of housing in it. And most of the plans I do for downtowns help them to understand the, the value of even subsidizing, heavily subsidizing large quantities of attainable, you know, diverse housing within the, the heart of the city. The safe walk is kind of the most obvious, but it, and it's also the easiest thing to fix because most cities own their streets. Now, many cities have one street or a couple that are state-owned or county-owned, but most cities have the opportunity on most of their streets to change their streets very quickly to make them safer to walk on. And the useful walk, the comfortable walk, and the interesting walk are all a function of the things that line the street, which are principally the outcome of private sector efforts that can be guided and can be funded by the public sector through codes and through tax increment financing and through lots of other different tools. But the bottom line is that's a long-term prospect that the city can influence, but rarely do directly and quickly. What the city can do directly and quickly is restripe a street that has too many lanes to have fewer lanes. It can make the lanes 10 feet wide instead of 12 feet wide, which means people will go 30 instead of 45. It can add parallel parking to, to protect the curb if the parking isn't there, or better yet, put in a bike lane or protected bike lane so that uh, cycling is, is more likely to happen. 
There are all sorts of things that cities can do. And in this age of COVID, we're working with cities now to widen sidewalks, to actually push sidewalks out into parking lanes, maybe push parking lanes out into the street, removing driving lanes. That's what we've done in my town to make social distancing more possible on the sidewalks. There's lots of things a city can do immediately to make their streets more safe, and many are doing it. The comfortable walk is a little bit counterintuitive because we all like wide open spaces, but actually what you learn as a designer, what you learn from Christopher Alexander, who you mentioned, and, and others like Jan Gale, um, that great designer from, from Copenhagen, is that people like to feel enclosed. A good public space is an outdoor living room, and a plaza is only as good as its walls. You know, a street is only as good as its edges, and the principal rule of making spaces comfortable is to shape them with the edges of buildings so that you actually feel enclosed. The evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, including humans, were simultaneously seeking both prospect and refuge. And prospect means you can see your, your predators before they get you, but refuge means that your flanks are covered from attack. And if, if you don't feel that your flanks are covered, you're not comfortable. And that's all about what we call spatial definition and shaping spaces with, with buildings and other things. And then finally, interesting is pretty straightforward. There has been a tendency in our cities to allow blank walls up against streets, to allow parking structures up against sidewalks, incredibly boring. Also to allow huge buildings that are repetitive and go on and on for hundreds of feet without changing, without having variety. The more horizontal modernists, and I love modern architecture, but the more horizontal modernist approach to facades is much less interesting than a vertical Lee or you know, a building with a vertical articulation, so you're passing more things as you walk down the street. And there's all sorts of tricks we use to increase variety. You know, we hide the parking lots behind thin liner buildings, and we break larger buildings. We use this tool that's, that's uh, called demise lines to break larger buildings into perceptually smaller buildings. So you have that sense of variety as you walk down the street. So that's a, that's a complete overview of those four categories. As citizens and people who are interested in walkability and this style of design, what kind of suggestions would you have for community members who would like to raise these issues within their communities? Show up. I mean, the, the amazing thing, and this gets into the, pro, you talk about processes, you know, the, the things we design are very important, but the processes by which we achieve those outcomes are often just as important in what the outcomes end up being. The typical city meeting, and these days they're much easier to get to because they're all on Zoom, the typical planning council meeting or even city council meeting, because God knows half of our city council efforts these days, there's so many things that cities could be doing that government should be doing to make our lives better. Yet you find in many cities, the vast majority of the city council time, independent of the planning commission, is spent on real estate right? What gets built where? Because people seem to care so much about it because in the suburban model, every new thing that lands makes your life worse. That's just a function of suburban design. So the typical city council meeting regarding a new development, which is coming to a community, is attended by the people who feel a need to attend. And those are almost entirely the people who live right by the project. The reason why city planning exists as a profession or as a need is because of the, the tragedy of the commons idea that a whole bunch of individual decisions made around what's best for individual people in you know, a normal marketplace will, may, might maximize those individual people's outcomes, but can destroy the community for everyone else, even in ways that undermine those individuals who make the choices based on what's best for their own backyard. So, and not to use an overused term, but the NIMBY, the not in my backyard people are the ones who show up because they are personally affected. They have every reason to show up and they need to be respected because in fact, what is happening might impact them in a negative way and their, their voices need to be heard, but they need to be weighed against the larger goals that the community has as a shared group. And just to give one example of the tragedy of the commons, the typical situation that you find in most cities is that everyone will agree, you know, they want to be able to age in place. They want to be able to find an apartment in their community when they get older. They want their kids to be able to come from college and find an apartment in their community when they're younger. They want workforce housing to be housed. They don't feel good about the fact that people who don't make a lot of money and that the police, policemen and the nurses 
can't afford to live in their communities and they want to change that. And when you poll them, they will tell you, we need more affordable housing in our community. Yet, when you have a public hearing about placing a large quantity of affordable housing in an area that's anywhere near someone else's home, those people tend to show up and only those people and try to stop it. And they won't say we don't want affordable housing. They'll say, what about the traffic? Or what about the parking? Or, you know, it's amazing the things that they care about that they, that they never used to care about. Like, you know, what about the um, impacts on climate change of these people and, you know, in this neighborhood? They'll, they'll, it's amazing what they'll come up with when what they're really concerned about is legitimate, but it's counter to what's best for everyone. So one answer to this problem is, of course, and, and this happens everywhere, is the city council or the planning commission understands this and they do their best to make decisions that benefit the whole community. But it's so hard for them to do that when 90% of the people in the audience are those who have a personal reason to oppose the project and the other folks don't show up. So if you care about good planning, if you care about walkability, if you care about affordable housing, if you care about equity in your community, all these issues that we care about as a society, but maybe we don't focus on day to day because we've got other stuff to take care of. You really need to show up at these hearings. So there's a good balance between those who have a personal reason to oppose a project and those of us who can represent the greater good. And speaking of the commons, I had David Bollier on the show a number of years ago, and I'll point some folks to that conversation if they'd like to hear more about that particular subject in depth. But I really appreciate what you share, because one of the conversations that we've been having within the broader environmental movement is the need for political action in order to make the kinds of changes that create these benefits and to be able to advocate for, as you were saying, there are people who are concerned about climate change as one of their reasons for pushing back against some of these projects to be able to discuss how this actually helps to combat those kinds of issues by reducing the needs of multiple separate housing to change some of the zoning for like how large a property needs to be for a single family home and things like that. And that the more we have conversations like this and become informed about it, the easier it is to show up to that meeting, you know, once a month and just be able to say, hey, here are the things that we believe in and here's why. Well, the problem is it's once a week often. <laughs> but thinking about being more instrumental in our conversation, I, I want to bring up just the two key things that people are often discussing right now in communities that I think bear mentioning. And you have a lot of communities doing two things. One, they are eliminating their single family zoning. Now, this has been misinterpreted by folks on Fox News as eliminating single family housing. (laughs) When in fact, and making single family homes illegal, which is of course a complete misunderstanding of what's being proposed. But what a number of communities are doing is actually saying, the areas that are, that are currently zoned as single family, yes, you can still build single family uh, homes there, but now there are other types of buildings, such as granny flats, you know, an apartment in the backyard, or duplexes, or very small mansion-like apartment buildings, which are now allowed in those neighborhoods. That's a national trend, and I think it needs to be made into a, you know, into a ubiquitous trend. It's really useful in this regard to research the history of single family zoning in the US. If you read a book called The Color of Law, which was the most important planning book written in the past couple of years, it shows how single family zoning grew out of race-based zoning. When it became illegal to zone by race, racist developers were looking for another way and racist communities were looking for another way to have the same outcomes without breaking the federal laws and single family zoning was their tool explicitly stated to accomplish that. So it's important to understand that single family zoning is racist zoning, and that's one of many ways that you can fight it. Secondarily, a lot of communities are eliminating their on site parking requirement. There was a news item yesterday in Pittsburgh that the city is eliminating on site parking requirements. Any investment in parking is an investment in driving, is an investment in global heating. That needs to be the fundamental conversation. Anything, you know, as Donald Shoup says, on-site parking requirement is a fertility drug for cars. Anything you do to make parking easier or required is going to make parking more ubiquitous, driving more ubiquitous, and uh, the driving lifestyle more ubiquitous, and climate change worse. So that's the powerful argument to be made 
for, for reducing or eliminating parking requirements. And, and again, just like with single family zoning, eliminating the parking requirement does not eliminate the parking. It just eliminates the, the artificial federal or local, I should say the artificial local requirement that parking occur on a site. And to go with the color of law, I would also recommend to anyone who has not read it to read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, which also details a lot of the ways that these policy decisions are made in a way to affect minority communities throughout America as well. Yeah, I would also recommend, and uh, I would say badly named, a very great book called Policing the Open Road, which talks about actually the rise of policing of vehicles, people in vehicles in the U.S., and what a tremendous impact the automobile has had on the role of police in our communities and the uh, racial profiling and other stuff that happens. I would definitely add that to the resource list for this episode so people can readily find that, the color of law and the other pieces that we've mentioned today. For folks who are interested in planning as a profession to bring this idea into their career as they're you know, leaving high school or looking for a career change, are there any recommendations that you would make for someone who would want to go into planning and to work on these ideas as a professional? Well, you know, I don't have a planning degree <laughs> and neither do my mentors. A lot of people who I respect quite a bit do have planning degrees and I have nothing against planning degrees, but I, I've always found that the people who have the most to contribute to planning uh, are the folks who bring something else to planning. It's very helpful to be a lawyer because there's a lot of laws that we need to fix. It's super helpful to be an engineer because our street engineering from 1940 to the present uh, has been absolutely destructive to the walkability of our communities. And I've learned so much from, from those few progressive engineers about what's possible and what can be changed to know that uh, we, we definitely need a revolution in street engineering in the US, similar to what grew out of the Vision Zero efforts in the Netherlands and Sweden and elsewhere to make our streets safe again. So I, I would say become an engineer, become an architect, become a landscape architect, become a lawyer. And certainly the more recent conversation and you know, that, that many people were waiting a long time for around equity in the, in the urban sphere uh, suggests that bringing that angle to a, a planning career would also be a very useful approach. Uh, I think that you know, I'm, always, I'm always telling young people to find a mentor. That's my main advice that I give folks is, you know, to find the, the, the person that they want to be and find anybody, you know, through any way possible, find a way to work for them, even if it's just fetching coffee. That was my entree into, into this. But in terms of, of written resources, this, you've given me the ample, you've given me the amazing opportunity to plug my new book. You mentioned Walkable City. I have a new book called Walkable City Rules. And I do say in the preface, the subtitle is 101 Steps to Making Better Places, and it's much more oriented towards people who are doing this work, even, even as, a, as, a, as an activist and not as a professional. But, but I say in the preface, if you read this book three times, you do not need to go to planning school. I also tell people always, you know, read Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Read that first. Read Suburban Nation, which I wrote with my mentors next, and then Walkable City. I would also recommend because, you know, it's delightful and I don't think anyone ever regrets it. I would recommend reading A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. As this is a show that also discusses gardening and green spaces, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on bringing community gardens into cities in conversations about street trees and other pieces that make our urban communities more verdant and vibrant? Well, obviously, I treasure those those elements of city making, both for their physical form and the community impacts that they have. However, you know that I'm a complete fanboy for street trees and that I feel that actually, that sounds kind of like obvious, but they're incredibly taken for granted. And there's a whole chapter in my book, Walkable City, just on street trees, because I, I feel that they're the one aspect of the, of the built environment, because we do put them there, that are never given proper credit, never considered enough when designing places, often provided in the wrong way. And the answer to so many of our problems is just planting trees. Why do you give that importance to planting trees in our cities? Well, there's, there's so many different reasons. 
and I list them and I'm, I'm remembering, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm resisting the urge to open the book, but I'm going to name a few of them. One is, is local climate. One good street tree or yard tree, but one good tree in front of your house has the same impact as 12 room size air conditioners running all day long. According, I'm sorry, it's 10, 10 room size air conditioners running all day long, according to the federal government. That impact is multiplied when it comes to uh, heat islands in a neighborhood by neighborhood basis so that, you know, literally having planted trees in your neighborhood can lower the ambient temperature in that neighborhood by, I think, 5 to 15 degrees, depending on, on how you do it. They absorb stormwater. Most people don't know that what, what happens when rain hits a tree. You know, the first half inch of rain is absorbed by the branches and the, the leaves. The second half inch hits the ground and then is absorbed into the soil and sucked up into the tree. Many, many cities have uh, stormwater problems. They have CSO problems, combined sewage overflows. They're spending billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars to solve their CSO problems. Where if they just planted a bunch of trees 20 years ago, they wouldn't have those problems. And then of course, there's just the beauty and the uh, impact on, on humans of having trees around. And you've probably seen those studies where people who are in hospital rooms with a view of trees versus those who are in hospital rooms without the trees spend a day and a half less in the hospital. Um, <laughs> you know, there's different studies that say different things, but the impact on our psyche and on our physical health is clear. And they also, of course, make streets safer. They cause cars to drive more slowly. They protect pedestrians from moving vehicles and they do a hundred other things. By the way, trees, uh, there was a study done in the city of Portland that demonstrated the impact of trees on revenues to the city because trees increase property value considerably. Having a tree in front of your house is like having an extra bedroom in your house. And the city did the calculation and based on the impact on property values from having trees along streets, they found that they pay one twelfth for tree planting and maintenance of what they receive in additional tax revenue from the presence of trees. Really creating a win-win situation for both the residents and the city. Yeah, unless you don't want your property to be valuable. <laughs> Which brings up a really, uh, a really interesting topic that I've only begun to address in my work, but I, I think one of the issues central to city planning, and I think that needs mentioning in conversations about city planning, is that city planning, if we do our jobs right, is about making places better. And if you make places better, you make them more valuable. And if you make them more valuable, you make them more expensive. And there's, with any good city planning effort, there is the prospect of displacement. Gentrification is the term people use. I don't like that term because it's, it's vague and more social, whereas displacement is a hard fact of people no longer being able to afford to live in places that we have potentially made better through planning. One of the rules in walkable city rules is to discuss and give examples of techniques that cities employ to fight displacement. And there are techniques and they are effective. And the real question in a city is, do you care enough to use these techniques? Community land trusts like were pioneered in Burlington, Vermont, turning renters into owners in neighborhoods, you know, having active city programs, subsidized programs to turn renters into owners uh, with mortgage down payment assistance and other stuff in neighborhoods that are being improved is a technique that, that's been used in plans that I've done. Offering property tax freezes to lower income and elderly people in these communities. And then of course, producing a ton of attainable housing. These are all things you can do to limit the displacement or hopefully eliminate the displacement in the communities that we're planning. I think when you're doing a plan, and it's now become my standard practice, when you're doing a plan in a community, it's your obligation as a planner to raise the, the specter of displacement and to talk about uh, the techniques that can be used, that must be used, if this plan is not going to have a negative impact on existing residents. Well, thank you for bringing that up because it's something that here where I am currently is in central Pennsylvania. And it's been some conversations I've had with some housing advocates and others is that there's been a multi-decade war on creating displacement in order to make some of the cities in the area more valuable 
for certain demographics and pushing others out to the fringes of the county. And it was really frustrating to hear that that was kind of what was planned around was to do that, as opposed to it being just a consequence of ongoing decisions. It's amazing to see how nefarious planning has been (laughs) through the centuries and through the decades. I was reading just last night in The Color of Law that, you know, we always talk about how insensitive it was, maybe that's the wrong word, cruel it was that the federal highways, the federal highway program when placing highways through cities did so in a way that destroyed so many uh, African-American communities. And the way I had always thought about it was, well, that was, you know, it was typical leadership at the time, not caring about the harm that it was imposing on these communities. But in fact, what you learn when you read the history is that many of those highways were created intentionally to remove those communities. It wasn't that the community was the cheapest and easiest place to put the highway. It was that the city was looking for a way, and and this is is recorded, the city was looking for a way to eliminate the African-American community near downtown, and that's why they put the highway there. It's incredible. In the few minutes we have remaining, is there anything else that you'd like to share with me or the listeners? Perhaps self-serving, but you know, I've been talking and lecturing and writing and just doing everything I can in the last 20 years to communicate these issues with people. And I really, I live to share these ideas. And so for that reason, I would direct people to my website, which is jeffspeck.com and it's S-P-E-C-K, jeffspeck.com, where there's just a ton of resources. There's plans, there's articles, there are a whole bunch of videos. I have a couple of TED Talks that cover these issues pretty fully, if quickly. So I, I think that, that my main, my, the main thing I want to share is there's a, there are a lot more resources available and, and a lot of them are, are on my website. And I'll make sure that people can find that, you, your books, and everything else. So thank you so much for taking this time to join me today and start this conversation. Hey, it was a lot of fun and thank you for letting me ramble on so, uh, so fully. Often. When an interview ends, the conversation continues as my guest thinks of other people whose work they recommend for a future interview, or of additional resources to include in the show notes. Sometimes, however, another thought comes to mind of something valuable to share. That happened with Jeff, so we started recording again, and he shared the following. I'm reminded that my mentor, Andre Stuani, wrote a book that might be of particular interest to your listeners which is called agrarian urbanism. And uh, agrarian urbanism is this idea about building a, a new community, not one new community, but building new communities, which are focused on gardening and farming at every scale. You know, from the, from the window box in the city center to the front or backyard in the, you know, suburban area to larger, you know, organic farming in the green belt, how you might organize Uh, new communities around this activity, I would also draw your listeners to, and they can just search it in Google Maps, to a new development called Serenby, which isn't that new anymore. It's probably 20 years old. That's outside of Atlanta, S-E-R-E-N-B-E, which is a new town that was created in conjunction with an organic farm and a uh, tremendous restaurant. And the idea that tending the soil serving the the produce and living in that environment in a community where some, but but not that many, in fact, of the members are doing the farming, has some legs in the real estate development business. But I'll never forget something Andres said about agrarian urbanism, which is that, you know, people need excuses to be social. And one of the great tools for creating community in communities is the front garden. Because if someone's working in their front garden, and we had this experience in Washington, D.C., where we, we built our new home with an uh, organic garden on one side of it, right up against the street, because the house was on a flat iron corner, a very sharp corner, so all it had was fronts. And we turned one of the fronts into, a, into an organic garden. When you're tending that garden, it's an instant conversation starter. Anyone who walks by wants to know, how are the tomatoes coming in? right? Or what is that herb that you've got there next to the, next to the window? 
so even at the the simplest scale of you know those meaningless conversations that build the bonds of community uh, gardening can play a real role in, in urbanism and that was jeff speck as he shared there at the end you can find him and his books at jeffspeck.com in addition to his website i've included copious resources in the show notes for you to learn more about what we talked about in this interview in his new novel utopia a permaculture vision Jeff Christou shares his dream of what a world that embraces permaculture could look like. In this clear, crisp narrative, we journey through the sensations and experiences of our hopes made manifest. Find out more and pick up a copy of the ebook today at permacultureutopia.com. Since recording this conversation, I have gone on to read Jeff's Walkable City Rules, which lays out in even more actionable detail what we can do to show up at planning meetings and be a force for change while preserving Main Street and reducing the impacts of climate change. As permaculture practitioners, our roles in cities and towns change towards an even more human focus to minimize the impacts of this increased living density on the surrounding environment and designing for living in place. For those of us who live in cities, and I'll be doing so in just a few weeks as I relocate to Falls Church, Virginia, there's a huge intersection between city planning, including the Parks and Rec Department, and our work as designers to get involved and take direct action through advocacy. We can argue for why we need to reduce speed limits, increase street trees, and expand green spaces. Imagine the more beautiful, verdant world we could have. But those are just my thoughts at the moment from this time with Jeff Speck. What are yours? Leave a comment in the show notes or get in touch. Email show at thepermaculturepodcast.com, schedule a call with me at calendly.com slash scott hyphen man, or if you'd like to send something in the mail and receive a postcard in reply from my extensive collection, you can do so by writing to The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. If you'd like more from the show, become a Patreon Patreon and get the weekly update, participate in the monthly AMA, and join the ongoing conversations about what makes permaculture permaculture at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. You can also make a one-time donation so I can buy a cup of coffee or three for those long editing sessions at paypal.me slash permaculturepodcast. You'll also find the show on Instagram at permaculturepodcast, or you can send me a tweet on Twitter at permaculturepod. Until the next time, Spend each day advocating for the place you live while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.